Today we're joined by Steve Milner of Gen2 Fund Services, Charlie Eaton of Eaton Partners, and David Tegler of Proskauer. Gentlemen, welcome to ProofCap today. Thanks for being here. Thank Our you. pleasure. We're talking all about fund formation and uh, fund formation specifically for first-time funds. Let's talk about a strategy that many first-time funds use, uh, which is securing an anchor investor to help launch their firm and I guess give them uh, um, additional credibility and crucially capital to get going. Um, David Tegler from Proskauer, maybe you can help us by defining mm -hmm. what an anchor investor is and why a, an emerging manager would want to seek one out. An anchor investor or a bell cow investor can be that investor that comes in with a significant amount of money and says, I will be an investor at your first closing. I will establish that you have a significant amount of capital right out of the gate. Other investors will follow me and through that relationship, um, I'll essentially help put you in business. Mm -hmm. Um, that bargain comes with a cost for the fund manager. Um, the cost is often preferential terms. They can involve um, a discount on the management fee, a discount on the carry, um, or preferential co-investment rights or, or strategic rights. It can often be the, the difference between success and failure for a first-time fund manager because of the dynamics with LPs and because people often like to sit, sit and wait and see what happens. Charlie, uh, would you recommend to an emerging manager to seek out a, an anchor investor, and if so, what kind of an institution would that tend to be? Well, I probably would recommend in most cases. It might take two years to raise a first-time fund, but the sooner you can get a first close, uh, the, the sooner you'll get that fund fully um, raised because usually there's a year between first close and final close. A certain amount of um, money that would be required, maybe it's 20% of the ultimate uh, target size, maybe you can get away with a little less than that, but, but if you're trying to raise a $500 million fund, it'd be nice to have a first close of $100 million. And if that comes from your own capital, and then a, a few outside endorsements or commitments, uh, hopefully with, with good names, because it does matter who your strategic investor is. There's some that will probably hurt you and some that would be very meaningful and add real credibility to what you're doing. Um, for example, uh, corporate sponsors uh, or big bank sponsors are not necessarily that desirable. Um, as anchors. From your experience, Steve, what are these cornerstone investors looking for uh, and, and why would the ability to back an emerging manager be attractive to them? What we've heard is that when an anchor comes in, it's a strategic investment. Uh, they're looking to do two things. Uh, on one hand, they like the team and they like the opportunity set. There's a trade for that backing and that trade can be in the form of reduced fees or preferred co-investment rights or even having some type of rights in successor funds that the sponsor launches. So they're looking to enhance their return set by coming in, if you will, on an early round. But in a certain regard, they are a regular LP and they're looking for a credible investment team to back. Our experience is, is when an anchor comes in, uh, their expectation is, is that the sponsor that they're backing will be successful and that they're going to have all the resources in place to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So the, the addition of strategic or a, an anchor investor uh, enables or provides a catalyst uh, for the sponsor to go out and be more successful in the market, but it also comes with additional uh, responsibilities, especially on the reporting and governance side. David, uh, as you have overseen negotiations between an anchor investor and, a, and an emerging manager, what have been some of the sticking points as far as terms and conditions? If you split it up into a couple of different categories, um, one obvious one is the economic deal. What is the economic deal going to be? And, and the dynamics of that are pretty straightforward. Um, how deep a discount on the management fee are the fund managers willing to give the anchor investor? Um, how, how much of a break on the carrier are they willing to give? How many funds are they willing to give in terms of follow-on rights to this particular anchor investor? And all those, I think, are, are in the parameters of negotiation, you know, each unique to each particular investment group. What can be very challenging, as Steve mentioned, is that there are upper tier entities. There's the general partner, there's the management company, and often part of the bargain is that the anchor investor wants to get a seat at the table in the general partner entity or a seat at the table in the management company. And as they start to um, get more seats at, on different committees and different groups within the infrastructure of the firm, then the fund manager's autonomy starts to become somewhat different. Charlie, you know, you mentioned that having a credible anchor investor obviously lends credibility to the uh, GP that they're backing, mm -hmm. but do you ever run into a situation where because of these bargains that are struck with the anchor investor, the other LPs to be shown the opportunity are maybe resentful or, or, or don't like the way the kind of the, the special alignment mm -hmm. that the GP has with its anchor? Well, the first thing is, did they give away too much? 
and um, and I've seen uh, situations where the anchor investor has as much as say 50 percent of the economics of the fund, and that's uh, probably a, a, a tough one to overcome. Um, I saw I saw another one where. The anchor had 35%, and that was also tough. And if you give away too much, then it becomes a little bit of an issue with some of the LPs. It's worth mentioning there's a spectrum here, and when you're talking about funds with outside support, there are um, there are captive funds, which are essentially in-house investment programs for larger organizations, um, and often most or all of the carry goes to the house in those situations. Steve, from an administrative point of view, what is challenging or unique about the fact that a Anchor Investor is also part of the management company, perhaps, uh, getting some of the economics, and what do GPs need to understand about the complexities when that's in place? When a Anchor Investor is introduced, the Anchor Investor's reporting requirements also become introduced. So by way of example, uh, we had a, a situation where one of the Anchor Investors uh, was a bank, and our requirement was to provide information upstream to the bank within three business days following a quarter end, as compared to normal standards, which might be 45 days. So when you insert an anchor, the anchor specific requirements uh, become, frankly, uh, foremost to the equation. Charlie, without necessarily naming any names, any anecdotes to share of an anchor investor coming in and fundamentally changing the way that a GP group operates in ways that maybe they did not anticipate? We had two instances, I guess maybe three or four years ago, where we were representing funds that were part of larger organizations, banks, in, in, in two different cases. Well, Dodd-Frank came along and Basel III came along and changed the whole uh, requirements, the, the, the rules and regs they had to live with. and. In both cases, these funds just fell flat. They, we couldn't raise them because uh, the regulatory issues that were brought up just uh, changed the whole game. The problem was that uh, they could no longer invest in these um, in these uh, subsidiary uh, teams that they had because of the regulations. Some of the examples of regulations that um, impact groups in that type of a way include Dodd-Frank, where the decision to have a firm registered or be exempt from registration could hinge on what type of sub-entities you have or separate accounts you have as part of the firm structure. We've seen a number of situations where, as a result of the Volcker Law, um, banks are spinning off uh, their PE businesses and essentially uh, giving the management team there the opportunity to become a first-time fund. And these organizations are very interesting because they come from an environment that's highly regulated, they had a substantial amount of capital, they had a big brand behind them, and now they're entrepreneurs. And the sea change of becoming an entrepreneur, both in terms of the operating responsibility, the regulatory environment that you work under, uh, is interesting. Emerging managers or first-time funds are a unique opportunity set for us, uh, frankly one that we really enjoy. Uh, typically, uh, first-time funds for us are three, deal, three or four deal professionals who've come together who want to become entrepreneurs. And uh, for us, that's exciting because we are entrepreneurs ourselves. So we get a seat at the table. We help our clients think through the ramifications of what it is going to take to launch the fund successfully. Uh, we have a boot camp that we call for first-time funds where we usually allocate an hour to go through uh, terms and how the fund's going to be managed. But what we really provide to a first-time fund is the ability to check the box as it relates to operating due diligence. Um, LPs are looking at a fund, first-time fund, no differently than they look at established fund, and they expect to see uh, certain institutional processes. The boot camp uh, evolved serendipitously, and we learned that it had success. What we find is that the uh, principals of the firm um, know the deal flow, but they really haven't been involved in how to run the business of the business. There are certain GPs that are very sensitive to managing the IRR, and there are techniques used, legitimate techniques, to help you know, in enhance the IRR. And we have a conversation about what that means. What we've learned is while the managers are oftentimes focused on the returns that they'll generate for their LPs, they also need to be thinking about the business of their business. And that can go from, you know, how the carry gets split, how management fees are structured, tax planning, personal planning. And they need to also think about um, future-proofing their business 
because remember, these funds have a 10 to 15 year life and things change and they need to put in a dynamic uh, to affect change. Oftentimes, we find that the sponsors really haven't thought about that aspect of the business. And so by dialogue and by engaging, we bring our experience of 25 years to the table to start to ask provocative questions.